Okay, we are back in Dublin now, and we are going to hear some of the background on the Irish language. And to do that, we are lucky enough to have an expert in the room. So I'd like to ask him to introduce himself. Okay, well, uh, my name is Dr. Kieran McMurray, and uh, I'm senior lecturer in the Department of Irish Language and Literature in St. Patrick's College, Dublin. Uh, St. Patrick's College is primarily a college for training teachers for primary school, but we also have a BA degree in uh, liberal arts or humanities, and we have a range of subjects which are taught on that course. Okay. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, to start off our discussion, just wanted to cover a couple of, of general issues, beginning with the terminology. Uh, what is the difference, if any, between the term Irish and Gaelic in relation to the language? Well, the term Gaelic uh, is used normally to describe, well, it can be any one of the sort of the main Celtic languages that are spoken in these islands. For instance, we really have Irish in Ireland, um, Gaelic or Scots Gaelic in Scotland, and Manx in the Isle of Man. And the Isle of Man uh, language, the Celtic language there, died out, the last native speaker died out there in the early part of the 20th century. Mm. And even though there's quite a significant language revival happening there now. But Gaelic, the term Gaelic is properly used to refer to the Celtic language spoken in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And Irish should be used to refer to the Celtic language spoken in Ireland. Okay. And Manx then for the Celtic language spoken in the Isle of Man. Mm -hmm. But what you find happening is that the term Gaelic is sometimes used in a disparaging kind of way mm -hmm. to describe Irish, rather like the English term Erse is used sometimes in a disparaging way to describe Scots Gaelic or, or, the, or the Irish of Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is particularly true of uh, in the north of Ireland where you've got people who are from the loyalist Protestant tradition who don't have really any respect mm -hmm. culturally for the Irish language. For example, Dr. Ian Paisley has often been heard to refer to Gaelic and it's meant to be disparaging. You know? ah. Interesting. And do those um, various branches of the language that you mentioned, do they comprise a certain language family? Yeah, most of the, as, as people would probably know, most of the mainstream European languages are deemed by the scholars or thought to, by the scholars to have developed from Indo-European, an Indo-European sort of mother tongue or root. And then in turn they subdivided into families or branches of languages like, for, for instance, the Romance languages or the Teutonic or Germanic languages. Yeah. So you've got this Celtic group of languages which comprise what are normally referred to as Continental Celtic and Insular Celtic. And Insular Celtic refers to, obviously, the, the Celtic of these islands, yeah. Um, yeah. Isle of Man, Ireland, um, Great Britain. Uh, and the Celtic, uh, Continental Celtic, then would cover things like Gaulish and uh, those languages, they have principally died out now. Okay. So the Celtic group of family, the Celtic group of languages is the mother group of, mm -hmm. of the Celtic languages in these, in these islands. Okay. And it, it may be an obvious question, but uh, did these languages develop where they are currently spoken, or that were, did they come from other areas within Europe? Well, I think what's generally thought of happened is that the Celts originated, well, one of the theories is, and one of the main theories that gains most credence is that the Celtic people as such emerged sort of Central Europe, and then with the movement of peoples geographically, uh, and first of all over the continent, and then by sea to Ireland and um, Wales and uh, the Isle of Man, etc., that those languages um, were, were sort of came from a mother tongue, like mm -hmm. a Celtic mother tongue. Sometimes it's called proto-Celtic, mm -hmm. that the, there was a one original Celtic language, which then as, as, as groups of people separated and moved away from each other, developed their own little idiosyncrasies and then became really were the forefathers of what we now know to be the Irish language, the Manx language, the Welsh language, the, yeah. the Gaelic language in Scotland. Yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, <clears throat> most viewers may be familiar with the the spread of the Celtic people within Europe. I, I recall recently reading an article where they even discovered uh, traces of a Celtic culture in, 
in modern day China. Okay. So it, it looks I'm as if they had I'm not aware of that, but it's <laughs> amazing. Gone that far afield. Yeah, but it's an yeah. amazing fact. Uh, particularly, <laughs> archaeologists are, are uncovering as, yeah. as archaeologists continue to, to, to search for yeah. artifacts and that kind of thing all, all over the world. Yeah. Um, I'd like to move on to the, the evolution of the language, and in particular, the uh, period of transition of, for the Irish languages going from oral to written. I believe uh, traditionally the languages were, were practiced orally and, and uh, handed down through the oral tradition. And at some point along the road, uh, written Irish came into existence. And perhaps you could provide some background on how that came about. Uh, well, we didn't have a written tradition in this country uh, until the arrival of Christianity because we didn't have any means of writing. Uh, there was no literary tradition, if you want to call it that. When St. Patrick brought Christianity to, to Ireland, they, shortly after that came the monastic, Christ, the early Christian system of um, groups of monks gathering together in small enclaves, which then gave rise in due course to the monasteries. Uh, and obviously, the first alphabet we had was the Latin alphabet. We didn't have an alphabet. The previous method of, of recording material in Ireland was the Oam, or sometimes people call it the Ogham, but it's O-G-H-A-M, but it's mm -hmm. properly pronounced Oam. Uh, but it was a very primitive system of just carvings on the edge mm -hmm. of standing stones, mm -hmm. and you were very, very limited in what you could do. Yeah. You could really only record the names of chieftains who'd fallen in battle and that mm -hmm. kind of thing, maybe some primitive date. So with the advent of Christianity, we got initially our alphabet, our first alphabet, uh -huh. that that was devised the Roman letters were, were changed slightly to coincide with a sort of a, a Celtic hand, let's say. Mm -hmm. They were first used in uh, in the um, the manuscripts that would have been um, compiled and illustrated in the Irish monasteries and things like, for instance, the famous Book of Kells, mm -hmm. the Book of Armagh. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the most ornate examples of that tradition. So in the early tradition, that initial literary uh, movement would have been used to record or copy the Gospels, mm -hmm. scriptures, theological and philosophical tracts. Yeah. But that was happening in the centers of learning in these monasteries, in the scriptoria, and was more than likely divorced from what was happening among the regular ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And that system persisted for a long time mm -hmm. because the people charged with the recording of the tales the epic stories, the poetry of the early Irish tradition, the medieval Irish tradition, but that sort of duty was, respon was uh, the responsibility of a very learned group of people mm -hmm. who eventually came to be called the Bards. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were responsible for recording that and preserving that in written form. But that was in a very highbrow linguistic register, mm -hmm. uh, which was, uh, again, divorced really from what was happening at ground level, let's say. And it was only really into the really into the 18th century that we began to have an evolving mm -hmm. literary culture mm -hmm. in written form, because at that stage, as was happening all over Europe, the print mm -hmm. uh, movement was growing in popularity. And uh, the print, uh, the medieval and later medieval and early modern print if you want to call it a print tradition in Ireland, was really kept to the manuscripts. And even in the 1800s and 1900s, scribes were still recording longhand mm. stories and things that might have been published in printed form. To give you a very good example, the topic for my PhD thesis was a collection of sermons which were written in Irish by a bishop who who lived first of all uh, in Donegal in northwest Ireland and was then translated as bishop from Donegal to Kildare which is technically in what they call the Pale, the area in the greater Dublin and outside the greater Dublin area where the English administration was strongest. And when Bishop Gallagher published these sermons, he published them in written form, printed form sorry, in 1736. There is no surviving handwritten copy, if ever there was such a thing, I'm assuming, at some point he wrote notes out. In 150 years later, those 
sermons, which were very, very popular in the oral tradition and the, the religious tradition, were being copied longhand by scribes uh, in vellum manuscripts and in sort of paper manuscripts throughout the country, when they had already been printed uh, in in Latin, yeah. in the Latin using the Latin or the Roman uh, letters, 150 years earlier. So that tradition, that that link between the the oral tradition was extremely strong. Yeah. Uh, and to, to use that example of those sermons just to, uh, for, to illustrate the point further, those sermons, in my thesis, each one runs to about 15 typewritten A4 double spaced pages. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's quite a lot of material. And there are uh, records of native speakers of Irish knowing not only one of those sermons by heart, mm -hmm. but the 16 of them uh, originally published knowing them entirely by heart and old women who could speak no English and could not write uh, either English or Irish and who, whose only language was Irish could recite these without any difficulty. Mm -hmm. That oral tradition was very very strong right up until about the 18th century when the growth of the print medium made it easier and people began to acquire the literary skills and that's when you see the sea change happening between the oral and the written tradition. Interesting. In, in that's a top, another topic that we'll uh, be dealing with in this segment is because the, the transmission of information about law occurred in a similar fashion and had a similar evolution, perhaps not surprisingly. That's right, and uh, although I'm not an expert in, the, in the, the native Irish legal system, because that in itself is a very, uh, it's a complicated area of study, mm -hmm. but we had our own system of native laws which were known as the Brehan laws mm -hmm. and Brehan derives from the word Brehev in Irish which means a judge mm -hmm. and in the plural Brehuna are judges and it was Tilihan the Brehun the laws of the judges effectively is what that term means and mm -hmm. that's how the English coined the Brehan laws mm -hmm. and that's why you got Brehan uh, quite close to Brehun which is a genitive plural of the word judge and that, that was a very complex and very well organized legal system. Mm -hmm. And again, not unlike the literary system, it was looked after and cared for by a stratum of society who were very, very uh, highly educated and skilled in the practice of the native law. And what happened, that particular corpus of, of legal, uh, of, of legislation, is that in the late 1500s, when the plantation of Ireland can be properly said to really begin uh, when you've got um, significant movement and colonization of the island by the English. They forced the abandonment of that corpus of laws because mm. they brought their own legal system with them, which is really the legal system that we still have in this island to this day. And I know we will be ending the session. You've been kind enough to volunteer to read a, a couple of poems, but. Uh, are, are, to preface that, are there some unique sounds or aspects of the Irish language that you could mention? Um, I suppose every language. I guess unique in the reference point would probably be English, but... <laughs> yeah, I think probably one of the... Well, I'll take a couple of things. One of the, I suppose, the key sounds that we have, which led the English to conclude that the Irish language was a barbaric tongue, was that we have quite a lot of guttural consonants that are that are sounded here in the back of the throat, like the ch sound that people find sort of offensive, or polite company finds offensive. <laughs> That's one thing. The second thing I'd say is that in, in this, in Ireland, the English that we speak, the type of English that we speak, is quite different from the English that would be spoken by somebody from England. Mm -hmm. Just as people from America speak English in a, with different accents and with different terminology than people who are native English speakers from England do. Mm -hmm. But we call it Hiberno-Irish or Hiberno-Irish here and it has been quite strongly influenced on two fronts by the Irish language. First of all syntactically mm -hmm. when you will find certain phrases, particularly in rural Ireland, that are strongly influenced by the, by the mother tongue. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, you might say in English, I have a great respect for him. In Ireland, uh, in Irish, the Irish language you say, Tam mas mor agam er. That literally means, I have big respect on him. Mm -hmm. And you will often hear in the colloquial, not even colloquial English, but the rural English of Ireland to this day, people say, I have a, he has a great mass on me. 
or I have a great mass on him. Mm -hmm. And mass is a direct borrowing from the Irish language. Mm -hmm. So it works on two fronts. Mm -hmm. And um, for that reason, has given the way we speak English in Ireland a particularly peculiar twist. Mm -hmm. And again, we'll be finishing this discussion by, by hearing some uh, Irish. But um, some viewers may already be familiar with what's, what's known as the Irish brogue. And I'm just wondering, is that a product of uh, the intonation in, in Irish naturally, just carried over into English? I'm not so sure. I think it goes further than that. It's a bit like what I was just saying about mm. the sounds that are sort of peculiar or, or quite uh, obvious in the Irish language. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's to do with, first of all, the syntactical issues that I was mentioning just a minute ago. And I also think it's strongly to do with the borrowings that came in words that are used, albeit in an English kind of address, mm -hmm. in, in in the English of Ireland. Uh, so, for instance, like uh, we have, uh, I mentioned the syntactical thing, but another thing that happens is word stress. For instance, in the south of the country, in the Irish of the dialects of the south of the country, that we were talking principally about Cork, Kerry, Waterford the stress in multisyllabic words falls towards the end in Irish. Mm -hmm. And that has translated through into English. So in parts of Cork and Kerry, people will not say committee, they will say committee. Mm -hmm. They won't say calendar, they'll say calendar. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of the influence of the native tongue on the way we speak English in Ireland. And then we've got a whole host of borrowings which have gone further afield even than Ireland, but for instance, the word slew, which is quite common, I think it's even in American English, you know, a slew of people, or a slew of changes, mm -hmm. and that's from the word slua, which means a crowd of, or more than, certainly more than one. Um, I mentioned the word mass, mm -hmm. and people, you'll hear people say here, oh, he has a great gra for, for Joyce, mm -hmm. and gra, and it's pronounced the same way, it might be spelled G-R-A-W in English, mm -hmm. but it's G-R-A, acute accent mm -hmm. in Irish, and it means a love, it means love, so, oh, he's a great draw for Shakespeare, would mean he's a great <laughs> love of the literature of Shakespeare, or yeah. the plays of Shakespeare. Then we have things like um, an Amadon, mm -hmm. which is you know, it's kind of stage Irish, an, am an Amadon in Irish means a foolish fellow. And uh, in parts of Wexford and Waterford as well, they've got somebody who's always complaining and who's never happy with his lot. You'll hear people say, he's an awful anishore. Mm -hmm. And it's, that would be A-N-N-I-S-H-M-O-R-E in English dress, mm -hmm. but it's spelt anishore, uh, I-N-N-E-O-I-R. And it's literally a word that means somebody who's never happy, somebody who's mm -hmm. always finding something to complain about. So all these things have happened. So I think when you talk about the Irish mm. brogue, it's wider than just an accentual yeah. thing. Yeah. It's got to do with syntax and also borrowings. Yeah. And in, in some parts of the States, uh, the term mug is also used, and I believe that has Irish roots. Uh, you don't need to see my mug or don't want to see his yeah. mug around here. Actually, <laughs> I'm not 100% sure on that one, but yeah. a book was written a couple of years ago by an Irish guy called Daniel Cassidy. And uh, it's uh, the language, uh, the language of the crossroads. I think it's called um, how the Irish invented slang. Mm -hmm. And he did a study of, based around the, the English of New York, particularly as it developed from the mm -hmm. out of the Irish community, the people who left Ireland and settled there, and mm -hmm. probably in kind of ghetto areas or, or enclaves where obviously like, the Chinese people gathered together in Chinatown and mm -hmm. Little Italy and this kind of thing. And he has a whole list of words that people have heretofore thought, well, that the, the provenance was, was uncertain or no. And for example, he quotes various words and he says, I've gone to the, the Oxford English Dictionary on this, and they've said a source unknown, mm -hmm. and yet it seems to me that they're definitely derived from the Irish language. Mm -hmm. and maybe we could look at that a, bit, a little bit later on, mm -hmm. but I brought the book with me. Excellent. But he's done a great deal of work on that kind of thing, but mm -hmm. mug and Things like dig, do you dig it, should yeah. take, that's from take, the <laughs> verb to understand in mm -hmm. Irish. And he has the word slew, mm -hmm. uh, he, jazz he, can, he thinks is from the word, the Irish word tas, which literally means heat, mm -hmm. but which has also secondary sexual connotations mm -hmm. you know, in terms of heat, being the heat passion. Yeah. And obviously even in modern day English, 
when we talk about somebody being sexually attractive, we say, she's hot, he's hot. Mm. So <clears throat> he, sometimes I think he maybe strays a little bit <laughs> too far, yeah. but many, many times I feel that he's a very close to the mark. Yeah. And might shindig, in terms of a celebration, fall into that? He, yes, yeah. he yeah. says that that's to do with shanti, uh -huh. which is, um, or shantig, uh, depending on the dialect yeah. pronunciation, which is where, uh, uh, you know, people got together in a house and they, <laughs> they, had, a, they had an ease up or a yeah. party, you know, to do with, say, around social events or family celebrations or yeah. whatever.